Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to AIDS Map Live. We've been having some technical issues, but I am now joining from my telephone. Um, so I'd like to um, welcome to this special AIDS Map Live on MPOX. I'm thrilled to be joined by an absolutely tremendous panel if we can have everyone on now please <laughs> hi everyone did you hear me all desperately trying to sort out my technical issues not knowing i was live <laughs> yeah we we heard you swear susan <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know it had actually begun but there you go the show must go on so if I'd like to introduce everybody. So first of all, we have Professor Chloe Orkin. Hello, Chloe. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Chloe is a professor of HIV medicine at Queen Mary's University of London and an HIV consultant at Barts. Um, next, we have Michael Akanji who coordinates the hi <laughs> lovely to have you on um michael coordinates the african key populations expert working group he also serves as a senior advisor in, in prevention and key populations and policy with heartlands alliance and nigeria welcome so we have uh, Lovely to have you here. Dr. Mateo Prushenska is a Peruvian medical doctor, epidemiologist, and control of infectious disease specialist with more than 10 years experience. Um, uh, Mateo is joining us from the World Health Organization. Um, uh, where he works on the HIV, monkeypox and STI response. Hello, Matteo. Hi, Susan. So lovely to be here. <laughs> lovely to have you. Um, and hi, hi, Will. Wonderful to have hi, you. Hi, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Will Nutland is a health and social social justice activist, researcher, and health promoter, co-founder of Prepster and its parent company, The Love Tank. Um, Will's activism, research, and health promotion um, was so impactful in the uh, MPOX outbreak. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. It's a delight to be here with you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Aaron Tuline is a sexual health activist and advocate and the training and volunteer coordinator for Positively UK and a freelance sexual health wellbeing support um, worker for the LGBT hero. And many of you may know that um, Harun was actually hospitalized with MPOX last year and has shared his experiences very broadly in um, in the media and also with the WHO and the UN. Hi, so Susan. And whereabouts are you, Huron? I'm in Barcelona, actually, and I'm, I'm enjoying like 21 degree weather and the hot boys around. But, you know, I could have missed this opportunity. So, <laughs> okay, Wonderful. So if people have any questions, do please get them over on to the chat. But, um, Huron, I'd like to start with you. You've played a, a really important role in raising awareness um, of... Um, Mpox. What were the main symptoms for you? Uh, so the, the, my main symptoms were like any other viral infection. It was high fever and fatigue and not being able to move and muscle aches. Uh, clearly in an, uh, in, a, in an era of COVID, um, I just immediately thought that it was COVID, mm. uh, especially the, the, uh, the pain and uh, not being able to move around. Uh, the fever, increasing fever was actually told me that, you know, this was something viral, but um, COVID tests were, you know, just all negative. So um, I just, I was just very curious myself as well um, at the beginning. Uh, and eventually it led, after a couple of weeks, it led to other symptoms, um, which shown 
as monkeypox and mpox, um, like um, the lesions in my throat, uh, and um, mainly in my throat actually, not in my body, and this famous lesion appeared on my face, on my nose as well. Um, so those were my main symptoms uh, occurred over three weeks time back then. And are there other symptoms, Chloe, that people should be aware of? Yeah, there's a whole lot of symptoms. So fever is one of them. Swollen glands is another. Those are the non-specific symptoms. But the real, the real key symptoms, the most common symptoms that people present with, more than 90% of people have a rash of some kind. And um, the rash is generally can be red, it can be raised, and it can look like sort of pussy blisters, um, and it can cause ulcers. Um, the sites that are affected, it's really important that the places that the rash comes tends to be associated with the place where there was sexual contact. So if you've had anal sex, you might get uh, lesions around the anus or the penis, um, oral sex, the mouth, etc. So I think that's important. But what's very different about this outbreak is that people are also getting ulcers inside the internal skin of the mouth, the anus, and even inside the sort of the, the, the inside the penis, you know, the, where you pass the urethra, where you pass the urine from can get very, very inflamed. And in women, uh, the vulva and the vagina. So those are also areas internally that you can actually have symptoms in first, leading you to think that you might have another type of sexually transmitted infection. All right. And, and Will, what would you recommend um, someone who thinks they might have MPOX that, that they do? Well, I, you know, recommendation would be to seek health advice, to seek health advice in a supportive, safe clinical service if you are able to do that. And we're really aware, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about MPOX stigma later on today, but I'm really aware for some people it's going to be really hard um, to do that if there is stigma attached to attending that uh, that clinical service. I'm based in London. I'm probably in one of the most privileged parts of the world in how I can access sexual health services. So if you are um, listening to this event from a place like London, then the first thing I would uh, recommend that someone does if they have these symptoms that Chloe has just described to us is to check out the protocols for accessing your health services. Some services prefer us to phone in advance because there may be enhanced safety measures they want to put in place, and this is going to depend um, where you are in the world. But I think one of the things that I really want to get across is that if some of us, for those of us who are sexually active, it's really important for us to have regular sexual health checkups um, to look for um, um, MPOX or other um, STIs, right now we know there's an awful lot of syphilis knocking about, and it could be that some of those um, symptoms that, that Chloe has just described, they might not be MPOX, but they could be something else. Much. And, and Matteo, um, MPOX seems to really have disappeared from the headlines. What's the current global picture for um, MPOX infections? Thanks, Susan. I think the key message is that MPOX is not gone. For example, in the last three weeks, we have received reports about MPOX cases from 27 countries. And this was definitely not the case before the outbreak that started in 2022. We don't call it the 2022 outbreak. We call it the 2022-2023 outbreak because it's continued into the new year. Um, we have uh, over 86,000 cases confirmed globally. Most of those cases happened last year. But for example, every week uh, we're seeing in between 130 and 150 new cases being reported to the WHO globally. Um, and the number of uh, deaths that are being reported has now slightly increased to 110. 111, uh, just because there's also better um, identification of MPOX, more access to diagnostics as well in many places that didn't have it before. But the issue with uh, with deaths specifically is also related with the intersection between MPOX and people who are living with advanced HIV disease without access to treatment. Uh, and and we're, I'm sure we're going to have more space for, for that conversation during the session. Sure, yeah, so, so Chloe, what do we now know about um, HIV and MPOX? So what we know um, from the early case reports is that in people with high CD4 counts, we didn't see any differences in the outcomes or how the disease presents. What we know is that between 38 and 50% of, of people 
who have got MPOX during 22, 23 have been living with HIV. So a high proportion of the people who've experienced MPOX have also been living with HIV. So what was the big data gap um, was really what about people with immunosuppression? So we led a large global collaboration uh, with 382 people living with HIV and CD4 counts less than 350 because 350 is the consensus uh, point where you would consider it to be a late diagnosis. But we also looked specifically at those with CD4 counts so in the lower strata, so less than 250 and less than 100. And what we found was some very striking, and very, very concerning. And to be quite honest, as someone who's looked after people living with HIV for my whole career, very, very upsetting findings. And I have to say I didn't sleep when I found these findings. So basically, um, people were developing, uh, people were dying. We saw mortality and there were no, nobody died with a CD4 count above 200. And as the CD4 count dropped, people were more likely to die. Um, and people died with very, very severe lesions, which grew. When I say lesions, I mean sort of ulcers, which sort of grew into each other and became, you know, very large. And they also occurred distant to the place where the infection was first introduced, which is different from what we see in other people. And we saw a lot of organ disease. So we saw particularly a lot of chest disease. And it was presenting very strangely in the chest in ways that we haven't seen before with sort of nodules, um, which look different to how um, other nodules caused by other conditions. So people were really very, very ill and had terrible outcomes. Um, so a really high mortality rate, nearly 30 percent with the CD4 count less than 100. And, and what that means is you could be walking around not knowing that you're living with HIV and have a low CD4 count less than 100 and you could get MPOX and, you know, that people had very prolonged illnesses of 100 days, very, very sick and then died. So you could actually go from living your life to dying. And I, I, I say this not to be alarming. I say this not to be upsetting, but I say this because there is something that we can do. There's a message here. OK, there's a message for every single one of us who's listening to this podcast. OK, if whatever chat live whatever it is if you know somebody who is not sure whether to have a test who hasn't had a test and just doesn't want to take that step encourage them because this is a time where you could save their life because we know that people living with hiv and low cd4 counts can look like anybody they may not be they may not look as though they're unwell yet but they may be unknowingly unwell so encourage people to have tests because you could save a life. Oh my goodness, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And and Michael, what's the implication for HIV programs, particularly in, in, in your regions now that we know this in terms of getting people tested? Well, the implications, just just like um, every other person has said, it's, it's basically enormous. Now, we also need to start looking at how do we also get people to start testing because there's a big testing gap in, in, in my region, most especially in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then the implication is also the added stigma this might also have to people um, who have the virus that might not want to get tested. And um, in because Africa, it's, it's actually a very restrictive policy environment in terms of discrimination against key population. It also has another effect on them because now it will now become very difficult to get people to get tested for HIV. And also as a result, it, it will also put a numerous challenge on prevention messaging at the community level and also prevention. Uh, um, um, distribution at the community level too. Yeah. Surely, uh, thank you very much for for raising those those really important points. And I think you know we're all aware that there still exists significant inequalities where it comes to HIV treatment and having people staying and engaged in care. So I mean, what can we do? What needs to change to uh, uh, address these these inequalities so that people aren't dying of MPOX? Over to any of you. It's a really wide question. 
Susan, Susan, for me, I, I, I think the, the, the question is partly to recast the conversation, and this isn't dying of mpox. This is also dying of undiagnosed, untreated um, HIV. And, and I totally agree with, with the call for action here from Chloe, and I want to add an additional call for action. So it's, it's, it's almost 27 years since the 1996 Vancouver AIDS conference where the results of those triple drug combination therapies um, were announced and that that research changed the face of how people in places like London and, and most of Western Europe can now uh, stay alive if they are offered an HIV positive um, test. And I think it's almost 30 years later, it's an absolute scandal that in places, parts of the world where, where I know Mateo is from and, and other parts of, of Central and South America, it's an absolute scandal that an HIV test that costs pennies to administer is not being made widely available. It's not available in community settings and that treatments that cost dollars per year um, to keep people alive are still not widely rolled out. And, and I'm, I'm tired of sitting in big international AIDS conferences when we see brilliant people call for actions and every single year I go to one of those conferences or see them online, we see these same calls for actions. And yet Chloe and her colleagues are clearly demonstrating that there are still hundreds of thousands of people globally who have not benefited from the healthcare that uh, that people like me and Harun and, and other people can benefit from. And it's, it's an absolute scandal. It's an absolute scandal. Um, so oh. can I come in? Can I second what everything that Will has said? Um, I think that we wrote an editorial very early on uh, for the Lancet HIV to try and educate cl clinicians and to tell people that every monk MPOX vaccination was an opportunity to test for HIV. And in all of our papers, we've really concluded with the statements that everybody should be tested. I'd like to raise another issue of inequity, which became clear during the HIV MPOX paper, in that um, in terms of vaccination, only 26 out of 382 people had taken up vaccination and only 21 of them had taken up pre-exposure vaccination. That means to prevent the infection, not being given the vaccine after you've been exposed. So this suggests that our efforts, whatever they are in all of these different countries, the 19 countries, many of 40% of the people in the, the, the study came from, well, I mean, a large proportion of the people came from well-resourced settings. OK, so this means that despite well-resourced settings, people were not taking up the vaccine. OK, these people with HIV and advanced disease, many of whom were diagnosed, OK, 50 percent of whom were diagnosed, were not taking up the vaccine offer. And the other half weren't, didn't know, you know, only 8 percent were newly diagnosed. So something is going wrong with the vaccine offer now. Whenever I, I give a talk about MPOX, I always showcase the work of the community and I tend to showcase two photographs. One is Haroon and one is Will. And I think that one of the things that's really memorable to me, and I actually asked my, my nurse colleague today to send me the photographs of Black Pride, where Will and some of my colleagues from Bath went and worked and offered a pop-up event. Uh, because I will maybe sick of seeing of listening to the calls. I tell you, what I'm sick of seeing. I'm sick of seeing these photographs of white men lining up at vaccine centers as an example of good practice and how wonderful everyone is in public health as a great public health success. Because this is a massive epic fail on my part. Um, so I think the question is, uh, we, I go back to my perennial question: What can I do? This is what every person has to be asking themselves. Okay. In my little world, whatever I am, okay, I'm not a public health, I don't work for the WHO, I'm a clinician in London, yeah? What can I do? So I can write my papers and I can write this into all of my papers. I can put it in my talks. This is what I can do. I can work with communities. If you're sitting there, ask yourself, what can you do? Thank you, Chloe. And, and Will, can you tell us a bit about your you know, the, the groundbreaking actions that you've taken in the community in, in getting the vaccines out and raising awareness. I can, Susan, but I'm also aware that Matteo wanted to jump in. So maybe, oh, maybe Matteo yeah, could go, I, could go I before me. I can't see properly from my phone as well. So Matteo and, 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 and Michael, Michael as well. 
Thanks, Will. I think what I wanted to say was I wanted to contextualize some of the discussion that was being had um, about the intersection between impulse and HIV. When I read the findings from, from Chloe and team's uh, research, I was struck about the large percentage of cases that were Latin American. 60% uh, of the cases were Latin American. And this is not because people are forgetting to test for HIV during the vaccination campaign. It's because there is no vaccination campaign in many countries in Latin America. Mexico has one of the highest uh, reported number of confirmed MPOX cases, and they don't have a vaccine strategy. Like people in Mexico who have been vaccinated for MPOX have had to cross the border and had a vaccine every and elsewhere. So we need to take a step back and realize that this is not a new clinical problem or a new clinical discovery. This is a long known public health crisis of poor HIV prevention, care and control in many settings where things, interventions like PrEP, HIV testing without stigma are not scaled up for people in these settings coming through the door of the clinic and asking for an HIV test says something about yourself that immediately decreases your value in society and getting that test means that you will be deemed as less valuable in front of others. And those are the kind of discussions we need to be having. At the center of this conversation, we should be talking about stigma and communities, and not just in London, where we have really good access to vaccination. Mm. Of course, things can be done better, but we need to think with context about what's happening globally. I think we're missing that. Sure, absolutely. Um, and Michael? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to also say that in my part of the world, integration of monkeypox intervention at the community level, it's, it's zero. So, so what, what you just only get, it's at the clinical setting, at the facility setting. So it's part of my call to action. It's also that when we're also talking about mpox, there's also need that for that community because the truth is there's nothing. You can't be discussing things about the community without the community being involved. There have been a lot of gains in terms of HIV testing, uh, uh, um, at the community level. So we can build on that and, and looking at what happened during COVID, using the community settings and community platforms in order to get to people, it worked. So we can also leverage on the same thing for MPOC at the community level, most especially using community lay workers to provide information, provide referral, referral uh, um, to facility for them to get tested and also to have access to vaccine. Now, another thing I also wanted to also have based on what Mathieu also said is that in my part of the world, vaccine, it's also another challenge. The issue of, of vaccine equity, it's something we also need to discuss in sub-Saharan Africa in relation to other parts of the world too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Can I, can, I, can I respond to, to what Matteo has yes. said? Is that all right? I completely agree with you that, um, completely agree with you that the issues are completely di disparate and that Latin America has been horrendously impacted, particularly in the, in the latter part of the, the outbreak. But when I say that we need to think about the vaccination access and the testing for vaccinated people, I don't work in Latin America. And I have to think about what's on my own doorstep because it's very easy to see it as an other problem. It's those people in Latin America, it's those people in Africa, they don't have HIV testing, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. We need to examine in Europe, in the US, where we do have access to this, in Canada, wherever we are, we need to examine what's going wrong on our doorstep and also support access to, to equity and access for people that don't have it. But we can't just make it someone else's problem. We need to recognize it. In this case series, 40% of people weren't from Latin America and they did not uptake the vaccine. So we are not succeeding. Do you know what I mean? We all have to look at the ground under our feet. And yes, that's a bigger problem, but we shouldn't let ourselves off the hook in the well resourced settings. Yeah, yeah we're very conscious that there are, are huge inequities within countries as well as um, between countries. And if I could turn to Will about some of the actions that, that you've been doing and, and what we need to do to address some of these inequities in the UK. So Susan, there, there, there are two things that I, I want to mention, the, 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 the under the radar vaccination schemes that, that um, I think is, is probably what you, you most want me to talk about. But there's before I get onto that, there's another thing and it links into what both Chloe and Matteo is saying is how do we how do we address 
health inequity is not just by me and my team and people like me going and providing pop up um, um, under the radar vaccine programs um, in places like East London or South London. Also, as as health promoters, as public health specialists, as clinicians, we have a duty to really question why these inequities exist in the first place. Why is it that a young queer migrant, a young queer person of colour is not able or does not feel able to access one of the main vaccine centres that we have in a place like London, when right now there are probably dozens of places I could go to in the next 48 hours to receive vaccine. There are fundamental issues of inequity that persist and will persist beyond MPOX unless we do not understand that our role is also to, to, mm. to shout and challenge the system. Um, you knew I was going to say something like that. But let's let's focus on, on the under the radar events. Chloe's also made a really nice nod to the work we did at, at UK Black Pride, where um, um, Bart's Healthcare, um, along with Homerton and, and the Love Tank and, and other colleagues provided MPOX vaccine to 260 people um, who rocked up on that on that day and the, the first weekend of, of August. And we were turning people away. And the for me, um, turning a people away demonstrated the resilience of our community, that people wanted to step forward, that, that queer men of colour and queer migrants at UK Black Pride really wanted to um, to receive vaccine um, uh, there and then. And then since UK Black Pride, we've been working on on, on a, almost a dozen now, um, what we're calling under the radar events um, in community settings alongside, um, again, those clinical colleagues that I've just mentioned and, and places like Guys and St. Tommy's, going into community settings and quite often not, not letting people know in advance that um, vaccine is gonna be um, available, but actually offering vaccine alongside um, other events that have, are happening. I want to champion the work of the Outside Project, which is an LGBT, LGBT homeless and, and housing project because they've invited us along three times now to their, their weekly drop-ins when we've been able to help um, administer MPOX vaccine to dozens of people, quite often people who are living in temporary housing or maybe in in multiple occupancy housing and or, or in secure housing. And lots of these people aren't currently accessing other health services or other sexual health services. And the great thing that we've been able to do in, in the winter was to also offer COVID um, and flu vaccines. What we've now been able to do, because we're obviously moving out of, of flu season, is to also th now think about offering Hep A and, and Hep B and HPV vaccine along, alongside MPOX. We did an event at Dalston Superstore um, just last week, and a third of the people who received MPOX vaccine also received um, Hep A and Hep B and HPV. So this, for me, is a nice example of how we can reach people who are not accessing sexual health services in a place like London and offer them a, a set of rounded um, sexual health services, including HIV testing and STI testing, um, if it's appropriate to do that within those settings. Um, but, Susan, again, I want to return to this issue, this, this, this way of offering MPOX vaccine in this kind of out of clinical setting way. It's expensive, it's not sustainable. Um, and I think we have to raise another question about how we work together so our NHS services can facilitate better access for these very people who right now are not coming into services. Oh, Chloe. At the beginning of the outbreak, Will collaborated with the the, uh, the research group that I direct, the Share uh, Research Collaborative, which is uh, a research collaborative that focuses on uh, infection and inequities. And together we co-created a survey. And what we found is that people, there were many people who didn't want to come to sexual health services. And we did a lot of granular analysis around whether the part participants who responded were women or, or whether they were people of color um, and we, we picked up some, we, there were some findings about preferences of where and, and of which sort of services people would attend. And there were also some very concerning findings suggesting that younger people would attend nowhere that wouldn't engage with services at all. And there were some real important findings around who was trusted, uh, which type of, who was trusted, was the government trusted, website trusted, healthcare providers are, are the most trusted, but people often didn't want to be seen in sexual health clinics, something we know. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, as someone who has just had my professorship title changed from professor of HIV medicine to professor of HIV, sorry, to professor of infection and inequities, 
Um, what mm. I think is that we need to understand, we need to stop grouping people together into categories like the horrible British BAME category. God knows what that means. Um, we need to be looking at very specifically at the t challenges that different groups have stop amalgamating them and try and be specific and understand the different challenges that people have and distract them out. And Vanessa Peer, my colleague, is an absolute pioneer in this area and she's spending time understanding the different experiences of Black Caribbean, women of Black Caribbean heritage versus Black African heritage. Um, because just lumping everybody as the same, you know, is really never going to get at the differences. We have to be granular. And we have to try and have a real willingness to understand different people's issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, absolutely. And I have the pleasure of co-hosting a series with Vanessa on, on health inequalities and actions that we need to address them. Uh, a, a shout out for next week, um, the next episode of, of Health and Power. But Haran, if I can turn to you, would you say that there are um, a stigma around actually having MPOX? Of, of course, of course, there is a stigma surrounding uh, MPOX and anything sexually transmitted illnesses. It's just, it just all came together, I think, after MPOX. It is heavily based on how it was represented at, presented at the beginning. Um, clearly, this was coming from uh, an attack to LGBTQ plus community as well. And I must say, I, I'm still facing lots of, lots of stigma based on the work I am doing and uh, people are just judging me, saying that all oh, sexual health workers, sexual health advocate, and had my impacts uh, and living with HIV. So it still shows that uh, the level of understanding in those kind of situations. And I'm kind of gutted that uh, this way of thinking is basically thinking that doctors cannot get sick. So just because I'm working in sexual health and just I have MPOX, it's just people are expecting me to just present like a nun uh, and then not having any kind of conditions like that. Plus, if you think that MPOX is just a temporary situation, you just have it and then you just uh, hopefully heal from it. Um, I've just been uh, very much discriminated, based, uh, mainly also in other countries. Um, in my hometown in, in Turkey, I'm trying to uh, make a noise as well. But even in accessing to HIV care and MPOX in there is a huge, uh, a huge stigma because if they do action on that, they will admit that LGBTQ plus communities exist. So there has been no call to action, nothing, not even a vaccination, not even MPOX cases declaration in there. So in the UK, while we have access to that much information and clear information through the voluntary organizations, I must say, uh, still having, even in the community, in our own community, being faced that much stigma kind of upsets me. And um, well, it never stops me and it, it, it will never. And I will always speak up and I will always try to be sex positive because I won't let anybody to blame those kind of conditions on sex or on, on certain communities because this is an infection, this is a viral infection, anyone can be impacted with that, and we have to take it with any other condition. We cannot let anybody to be blamed or to be accused uh, of whatever their conditions are, and we have to look at the broader picture to offer help and support to everybody, actually. But yes, stigma is still there. Even a year in, I'm still facing lots of uh, judgmental questions and um, comments, I must say, from people. Right. Uh, thank you. And and do you think that sometimes the media coverage can make stigma worse? Would anyone like to think about that? Chloe? Well, we investigated this. Um, and what we saw was that people said that um, the, the people that were spokespeople in the media didn't represent them. The people who are speaking from public health agencies, the people who are on television, people who are discussing MPOX did not represent them. Um, and many people found the, the coverage to be racist. Um, again, there were differences in who felt it was racist. A lot of people felt it was homophobic as well. So I think there were concerns about that. Right. And, and Matteo, what was the, the thinking in, in terms of the name change from monkeypox to MPOX? Well, I think um, WHO does a lot of social listening, which involves looking at different social media channels and identifying the discourses that are being built around illness, infections, and diseases. 
And in the case of uh, monkeypox specifically, the fact that the word, that the word monkey was part of, of the name of the disease meant that people were first wrongly associating this with monkeys specifically, but also repeating all tropes of associating um, sexual behavior between animals and humans as the way in which people could get the disease. Um, but also it was perpetuating some racist stereotypes. There's also issues with the translation. Uh, in, in Spanish, for example, monkeypox could be translated, it's translated as viruela del mono. There's a different words. So it's the, it's the pox of the monkey as well. So it had to do with, with the way language was being used around the incident that the name for mpox was changed. Throughout the first year of the change, we're uh, encouraging people to use both, but also to get used to the new term. Uh, and moving forward, we're going to just start using only mpox. Um, that being said, I also think it's, it's quite important that we realize that um, a lot of the media coverage that happened uh, around the outbreak was very sensationalistic at the beginning and very focused on creating fear or clicks. Um, and what we have found is that the message matters as much as who is giving the message, right? So if a public health agency, for example, um, provides some comments about uh, the risk of mpox among people who are gay or bisexual, it's very different than a community-based organiza organization that already has trust built with the community, saying exactly the same message. It's very important we also focus on who is saying the message to advert stigma. stigma. Right, thank you. Thanks very much. We're getting some questions over. I'll pose this to you, Chloe. What do we know about MPOX in children? So, um, fortunately, there haven't been very many children who've been affected by MPOX during this outbreak. Uh, in the large women's case series that we did from 19 countries, what we found is that although children were in the homes of 25%, or so a quarter of the cis women in the cohort, it was a large cohort of around 400 people. There were only two instances of, of children developing MPOX. Um, and this has been seen replicated from other cohorts because I've reached out to the international collaborators and there are hundreds of them and asked if, whether they have children so that we can report on this. And there's almost nobody, I've you know heard about four or five children out of all of these investigators. So it's not really happening. What we do know from the past, um, prior to 2022 is that children used to be the most affected because they would come into contact with affected animals. Uh, and this is in historically affected countries. And then they would get quite severe disease related to the site of wherever they'd, they'd been bitten or, or touched. Um, and it would be lots of lesions all over the skin. And children are often more affected uh, than adults in those settings. So we were pretty worried about this, uh, but actually this hasn't been a feature of this, of this outbreak. Um, you know, a prominent feature of this outbreak. Okay, fantastic. And another question, what do we know about women and MPOX? I know that you were presenting that yeah. at the, the conference that we were both at in Seattle. I was. So, um, okay. So we did a case series on women and by that we mean uh, a trans inclusive definition, which means cis women, trans women. And we also looked at non-binary individuals who assigned female at birth. And we did what we should have done, which is to report the data separately uh, to describe the data uh, for cis women and for trans women, uh, because there were similarities and differences in what happened for the two groups. So what we found is that in terms of cis women, how it presented and the anatomical uh, vagina is you've got uh, very similar looking ulcers to what you would see uh, in men. And you would also see vaginal lesions. So you'd see ulcers inside the vagina and you saw oral lesions. You saw everything in a very similar way. Interestingly, the same way that we found the virus uh, in semen in the large male case series, we also found the virus in all 14 samples that were tested in vaginal fluid. So it is actually present in vaginal fluid, which further strengthens the argument that it can be transmitted through fluids. So we found that in terms of the, you know, the associations, um, there were more cis women who had acquired MPOX outside of sexual contact. And this was generally related to their occupation. Some people were cleaners, some people were teachers, some people were hospitality industry, healthcare workers. Um, and we, we saw differences which indicated for trans women that they may have been experiencing difficult lives. 
um, it, it, people were reporting on, on on more partners, less likely to have sort of st- stable partnerships, um, less likely, you know, less likely to be working, more likely to be to be doing uh, sex work. Uh, so we we found that trans women were having you know, harder lives. It appeared. Um, and um, and and in terms of the site of, of of disease for trans women, it was related to the site of sexual contact. Right. Okay. Thank you. And and it, what about in, in pregnancy? Yeah. So pregnancy, um, the worry in pregnancy is transmission. That's the key worry, really, particularly if you get mpox in late disease. So you, the the worry, firstly, is 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 that you might lose the pregnancy. And there may be damage. It sort of, you know, the infection may affect the the developing fetus, or and then ultimately baby. Um, and pr- premature um, deliveries and and sort of stillbirths have been described. Um, but there have also been descriptions of 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 babies being born with mpox or developing mpox shortly after delivery. And this has happened during this outbreak. There have been some some people that have delivered shortly after the, the, the shortly after uh, after birth. Um, and, and, and neonates that have developed M- mpox and have been treated with uh, antivirals and done okay. So there have been a few cases, but not many. But it is a worry because pregnancy, um, because in pregnancy you're carrying essentially a foreign body, uh, your immune system is less a- active than it would be outside of pregnancy. So you have relative immunosuppression. So therefore, if you have any immunosuppression, you're more likely to become more unwell from an infection. So the pregnant woman or pregnant person themselves may experience um, more disease. Right. Okay. Thank you. And, and Matteo, what do we know now about reinfection with mpox? Well, we have some evidence about some cases that have experienced reinfection. But again, we always need to look at the evidence very critically because, of course, these cases sometimes are exceptions and they get they get amplified a lot because there's a clinical novelty element to it. What we know from previous immunology from smallpox and from pox viruses in general is that uh, immunity from pox viruses tends to be long-lasting, life long-lasting. Of course, there may be different situations that make uh, immunity uh, we wane over time. Uh, so these cases are being investigated, but it's a very, very small handful. And we have every evidence to believe that the vaccine is uh, providing a lifelong immunity that, of course, needs to continue to be followed through the next years. I, mean, I, I would just add I would just add to that that I think there are a few. Ca- you're right. There is a small number of cases and it's creating a lot of attention. I've been contacted by clinicians you know, throughout saying, I think I might have a reinfection. I think the only caveat, Matteo, to the lifelong immunity of other pox viruses is how much this virus has changed. Um, you know, there is a 50 base pair changes and that this virus is, um, it's changing at the places where it interfaces with the host, the human being. Um, and it also is changing at the, in terms of virulence. So um, it, it may be that this particular strain um, of virus is different to what we've seen in other pox viruses. So I think we just have to bear that in mind. Right, thank you. And and we know that mpox isn't just transmitted sexually, particularly in African regions. Do you think that there's enough attention um, to that? I don't know if Michael wanted to answer, but I'd, I'd be happy to come in after him or with him yeah. or whatever. Yes, I, I, I want to answer that. In terms of, of this, because it has always been in Africa, it's, it's been in Africa before before we started um, having the media attention concerning the mpox. So in terms of that, you, you find out that um, the attitude, even seeking clinical uh, uh, facility to, to go and test, it, it's still very low because it has always been like that. That apathy is, is still there. That, oh, why now? It has always been with us. We have a way of like getting it out. But, but be that as it may, you now have like um, the National uh, Center for Disease Control now have like a control center where people can call. And and, and there's, there's also like a public health guideline that's been issued that even from the local level at the community level, if you see some of the symptoms, you can report and how to escalate for people to also respond to that. But but um, despite that, the the apathy towards mpox in this part, it's also there. Then then at the same time, where you also have um, 
sexual health clinic like the organization I work with. We've also integrated um, MPOX education into our HIV education program in order to for people to get to know about it, for key population to get to know about it. But at the same time, um, if you look at, at, at the pattern in, in this part, it's, we, we've not been able to see the clear linkage between sex and, and also MPOX in, in this part of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Can I just say that my worry about all of this is that now that it's become the disease that's come to the West, all of a sudden everyone's very interested in it. No one cared about anybody before and no one cared that they didn't have the ability in historically affected countries to even confirm the diagnosis. They didn't have lab capacity to do that. This disease has, has, has been in humans since 1970 in historically affected countries in Africa. And it has been a disease that's been spread by contact with animals. And this disease still exists in those countries. And what they have experienced should not be erased from history. And they're, they're them being told now that this is a sexually transmitted infection and that's the only thing that we, we, anybody's interested in. This is a disease which is transmitted through contact with animals, okay? And it is also transmitted, this particular strain, okay, which is now in other countries and being and sustained human to human transmission is also being transmitted sexually. Now, Professor Demia Goina, who's probably the world expert on MPOX, I would say in my view anyway, um, is um, has been saying and writing and trying to tell the world that he suspect and he suspected during 2718 that it was being sus uh, transmitted sexually. Okay, so it's likely that this strain may also be, which has evolved from Nigerian strain that Nigerian strain may also be transmitting sexually, but we mustn't forget about the fact that it's transmitted through animals and presents differently. And in countries in Central Africa, it's a different type of virus. And this is even a more aggressive virus. And in that situation, we don't know anything about sexual transmission. It appears to be transmitted through contact with animals. And that must not be erased from history. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Matteo, would you like to Yes, maybe to add... Yes, maybe to add it from, from an old age perspective, the way we work, the way we organize work, the African region is very much at the center of the response. Um, there's uh, people in our team who have worked for, uh, in MBOX control with a focus on the African region, which was the affected region for decades, for a long time. And that knowledge is being translated and incorporated into the response as we go. And definitely part of our current strategic approach is also increasing the country level support to specific uh, countries in Africa that require support with uh, genomic surveillance, for example, to answer some of the questions and gaps that Chloe has highlighted, but also increasing the testing and detection capacity, which is why we have a very comprehensive laboratory pillar as well. So all of this is, is incorporated in the response, but I completely agree with you, Susan, that we must not leave uh, the African region behind, especially because there's a lot of, of, of knowledge about uh, this, this illness that is now affecting many parts, many parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got a question that's come through. Uh, I'll pose to you, Chloe. Um, can someone breastfeed if they have MPOX? It's a really good question. Um, I would say that you, I think you should be cautious because we don't know how it's transmitted. We know it's transmitted through vaginal fluid. It's transmitted through semen. We don't know whether it is in breast milk. But if it's in... in, in one fluid it could be in another fluid um it has been found in csf it's been found in respiratory fluids um i think that on the safe side um if you've got a bad viral infection you, you and you don't know if you can transmit it it's probably best a formula feed would be my advice based on zero evidence <laughs> uh, mateo have you got any uh, insights on that Yes, I think it's also worth considering that in, in the process of, of breastfeeding, there's also exposure to respiratory secretions, skin to skin contact. So the, the transmission risk or potential should not just be assessed on the breast milk alone, but also on the act of, of holding the baby, of, of cuddling. And, and you can, because you could give someone the advice of maybe don't breastfeed, but they will still be exposing the baby to other 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 types of contact right so so these kind of questions should be should be uh, given in, in context to to the patient and their needs as well all right okay thank you and I, i'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of 
activism when we've certainly seen that in relation to to HIV um, over the years. Um, Will, how important would you say that activism is in in terms of the uh, MPOX response and and helping to um, fight inequities? So, Susan, it's it's been essential for I know there are people in this. Uh, in this conversation, who've been in meetings with me um, across the summer when um, activism has been really important. And I think activism has played a part on very many levels. So I, you know, I've said this before, but Haroon's activism in being very out and upfront about what happened to him and 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 the bravery that Haroon showed um, has been essential. It's a it's a form of activism that maybe many people wouldn't describe as activism, define as activism, but. But it is, and seeing um, in the summer, <clears throat> excuse me, being in, in, in a meeting in the summer and seeing those images of Haroon, um, I, I was so upset by those images of Haroon and by, by hearing from Haroon directly how he was being treated, that that galvanized an anger and a passion in me and in other people in the meeting I was in at the time that meant enough, a, a bunch of us just said, we're, we're not putting up with this. Um, action has to happen, and, and action has to has to happen now. So there was actually kind of a a, a trigger point that that Haroon was responsible for, and he, he knows that because we've talked about this. Um, but Susan, I think I I really want to continue to reframe what we mean by activism and what we do about activism. And activism isn't just about people getting angry and taking placards onto the streets. And in fact, in lots of the um, of the responses to, to MPOX across the summer. That's not the kind of activism that got um, some of the results that were needed. Activism includes um, the activism that happened um, amongst people in the NHS um, who called out um, the, the lack of clinic capacity to deliver vaccines, even though we had them. There were people within um, institutions like UKHSA and in other government bodies who, whether they were able to stand up publicly and talk about what they were doing, they were absolutely forging change and writing policy and poking politicians um, in the right way to ensure things like um, um, vaccine procurement happened. And whilst um, what we saw in the UK was, was in no means perfect, I would say we got to the stage of where we are now because of activism on very, very many levels. And, and again, I know I've said this in, in a number of other forms before. For me, one of the great outcomes um, was seeing uh, UK-based queer activists starting to become international, active, international health activists and understanding more about health inequity and how things like the pharmaceutical industry works as a direct result of the conversations we were having um, last year and have continued into this year um, about MPOX. And I think there's a whole, there's a whole book to write about um, what we can collectively learn from, um, from what's happened and how that can galvanize us in, into being activists. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Haran, I remember um, that you speaking to you, um, doing an interview with you from you being in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> That was my fourth day in the hospital, <laughs> and, and you actually like pressing, a, try desperately trying to get um, a, an internet connection yeah. to be able. To... <laughs> I remember pushing myself to the corner to be able to talk to you in my bed, but <laughs> so so Haran, on on a, a personal level. I mean, how do you, I mean you've made such a tremendous contribution in terms of the MPOX response, but what what's been the impact on you in terms of everything that you've done? Uh, I think I'm just taking it. You know, when when I did this, I just um, it, because it struck me at the beginning. You know, this is all happening like HIV AIDS happened like years ago, and let's not let this happen in the same direction, not, let's not let this go in the same direction. So that was my starting point when I started to share my own, own experience. And as a peer mentor, HIV peer mentor, I just, I just felt like I, was, I had to share my own lived experience to others to kind of show them what it means and how it means. Some people took it as like I was trying to scare people, but no, all I tried to say was 
my CD4 count was 1500 and I was a perfectly healthy person and I was hospitalized, which is still the reasons that are known to me. So I was just trying to tell people that we have to be considerate, we have to be kind to each other because we don't know at what level we're gonna we're gonna be infected or just you know been transmitted to this illness uh, so we we have to be we have to be thoughtful of each other and protect each other because if we don't protect each other and if we don't become the best advocates of our own good health no one else gonna do that for us it showed it greatly in the impacts response from the government you know the community response was in the front liners because if we don't stand up for ourselves no one else will will do that for us so that's that's just still this the fire is still on obviously and it's just you know reflecting on all the other areas that i'm working with right now but i just want everybody to see that taking the control of their own lives and looking for their rights and then just do the right thing for themselves and for all of us because if I always say if one of us is not safe, none of us is safe. So we have to start from there. And I think that's my fire to go right now. Well, thank you. And um, we've only got a couple of minutes left to go. So one quick fire question to you all. One action needed to end global transmission of MPOC, starting with you, Will, one thing that you'd like to see Happen. I want us to, to see us completely overhaul the pharmaceutical industry and the relationships between governments and pharmaceutical and completely rethink how we can make drugs um, available um, at the cheapest possible price for everybody who needs them around the world, drugs and diagnostics. Wonderful. Matteo. I think I want us to start th seeing HIV prevention and care as part of uh, the preparedness work for any outbreak of any infectious disease. I want us to realize that we really need to work around improving access to HIV prevention and care in places where there is no good access. Haran. I just uh, want to say that I think we need more scientists like Chloe just willing to work internationally and bringing all the data together, thinking that the conditions are not specific to the regions and it may become a global uh, problem anytime. And not if we shouldn't think any conditions separate than each other because they may come together and hit back in a full force. So we have to take healthcare as a global response in, 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 in all, in, as a complete. Wonderful. Michael. Oh. For me, we need to also think in the context of health inequality, how do we make people to access what they need to be healthy and their well-being? It's very, very important in their own context, no matter where they find themselves. Wonderful, thank you. Finally, Chloe. Okay, so two things. I think firstly, each of us needs to be more Haroon Tulane and ask ourselves in the worst situation when we're in hospital at our lowest, very ill and at our worst, what can I do to help others and ask if there's anything and try and do it. And secondly, thank you for mentioning healthcare providers. Um, today, the junior doctors in the UK are striking because of our working conditions. I've done a, I've led a very large international survey on the health of healthcare providers during this outbreak and we'll be presenting data hopefully soon. I want to tell you that I would like for people to learn from these these two pandemics because I can tell you there have been very few learnings and that there are very few doctors going into infectious diseases in, in the US or in the UK. You know, infectious disease doctors are on their knees and I'd like for anybody who listens, who has any any power in policy or, you know, to bear in mind that there needs to be a workforce to care for people. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all so much. We're now out of time. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining today, putting up with all the chaos of my technical issues um, and, and sharing all of your really important insights. Huge thanks to Disruptive Live for somehow keeping the show 
going. If you'd like to find out more about um, MPOX and HIV, please go to the AIDS map website. And if you're interested in health inequities, do please join me and Dr. Vanessa appear next week, Thursday for Health and Power live broadcast on um, AIDS map Twitter and Facebook and hopefully by then I would have sorted out my computer but thank you all so much for joining us today. See you soon. Bye-bye.